hearing the voice of a thing. It's character, it's secret. Mm-hmm. Hey. 
inner sense is open, the more capable the inner sense is open. The more the inner sense is open. Hi everyone, welcome to the post-film chat for Beneath the Surface, created by Marissa Michelson and Miriam Parker. I'm joined today by Marissa, Miriam, 
and sound designer Hanan and video collaborator Christina. We are broadcasting from the occupied and unceded territory of the Canarsi and Mansi Lenape people who have stewarded this land for generations. Please join us in acknowledging the Canarsi and Mansi Lenape community. Their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. National Sawdust also acknowledges our country was founded on exclusions and erasures of many indigenous and enslaved people. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and genocide. My name is Danielle Shelley Levy, and I'm the digital producer for National Sawdust. So hi everyone, it's so great to have you here um, all together after the premiere of your piece. So first of all, big congratulations to all of you. I know we've all been talking about this and working on it for several months and it's always really exciting to just finally see it all, all come together um, and in everyone's homes. So my first questions are really for both of you, Marissa and Miriam. Um, I know that the piece was created by both of you and that you were involved in like every area and so many different aspects of this collaboration that I feel like your credits don't sit neatly into one category or the other because you had your hands in, in so many different aspects. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm curious, since it was your first time working together, how you got connected and what inspired you to come together on this project? And if you can also elaborate a little bit more about the ways and the areas in which you were involved. Mm -hmm. You want me to take that, Miriam? Please, yes. Okay. You were the instigator. I was the instigator. So um, I, I've told this story a lot now. So I met Miriam in the fall, just before being contacted by National Sawdust about this amazing opportunity to create a piece. And we met through a shared Buddhism meditation community called Three Jewels in New York City. Miriam's a meditation teacher there, and I was taking an ACI course Asian, from the Asian Classics Institute. And I just was always drawn towards Miriam's energy um, in meditation and in some of the classes she was leading. And we had a number of people in common, and I spent some time with Miriam's work online and just felt an immediate kind of hell yes in my body, a kind of feeling of really, really getting it, which I don't know if that's true or not, but that is definitely how I felt. Like I, I feel this, I feel this lives in me. And I was actually telling Constellation Corps, my ensemble the other day that I had a, I've never ever, we've never worked in the digital realm before. That was something entirely new. And one of the, one of the kind of grounds we stand on as a group is live performance, is kind of activating our energies in live space. It's something that's always been really important to me to, to be in a shared space with an audience. And in some ways, I've always imagined that was the only way that we could really get our work across. Um, but when I saw Miriam's work, I felt like what, what she was doing with Christina was creating in me a similar kind of expansive space and response and journey and awareness that I was interested in and personally uh, attending to inside of Constellation Corps. And suddenly I felt like there might be a possibility of moving and interacting with digital media in a way that could still bring some essence of what we do alive. So that felt really exciting. And we never would have done that, of course, if it weren't, at, at least at this time, if it weren't for COVID. So it was a kind of interesting timing. So in, in addition, Miriam's using her body as the medium and the material to create this digital work. And as you saw tonight, she's an absolutely incredible kind of mover and feeler of space and being and existence in the, in the space. You can feel it through the screen. And so when Sawdust gave me this amazing opportunity to create a piece with Constellation Core involved that was both digital and about composers and collaborators, which on some level really meant music and movement, 
uh, it was this kind of perfect set of circumstances for me that it felt just like I want to ask Miriam if she would be interested in creating something together. Something about the timing, the meeting in that class, the fall, then suddenly getting this opportunity. It was all happened so quickly. So I called her and we talked and I think, you know, it was a really great kind of adventure. Like, let's just jump into this adventure. And that was something I felt excited about and passionate about was what will happen in a space where Miriam and I meet? Like, what will happen? And I wanted to be open to not coming to Miriam and just saying, this is what we're creating. This is what I'm working with with Constellation Core. And here's what I would love you to do. Would you like to film this, document it, um, and just kind of present, present our work on the digital screen? It was more like, how can you and I interact and how will we, how will we get to know each other along every step of the process and allow that process itself to inform what we're creating? Yeah. Amazing. And Miriam, what was it like for you coming in? Like what parts of the piece were already in place when Marissa invited you? And then where, where did you really enter the project? Um, I, I think I'm correct that Marissa came with very little parts of the piece in place that the intention was to open up a line of communication and through that coming mm. together that that's was going to be the beginning of the forming of the piece, which was very indicative to what was, I believe what was shared from um, Marissa's side what was on her mind and her interests and was a, a very easy place for me to meet her, which was like, how do we come together? How do mm -hmm. we meet? What is this space? And I think from getting to know Marissa um, slowly and, and gradually through this process, uh, I kept hearing from her and correct me if I'm wrong, Marissa, that mm -hmm. there was, she was coming to me at a point where she was very much interested to see what existed outside of the creative process with that she had been developing with create uh, with constellation core. Mm -hmm. So there was that jumping off point that I was being I was hearing from her of this interest of what does it look like to move beyond um, that that relationship and grow mm -hmm. and, and what is that. And for me, I'm always, I'm very, very interested in how does the situation and the questions that arise within a, or the challenges, the interests and the challenges, the inquiries and the um, un misunderstandings, how they, um, how they affect the work themselves, how they mm -hmm. become color of the work. And so I tend to, come into my work with a lot of questions and not so much of a an interest to display um, or yeah display some sort of idea that I have I don't work with ideas that are um, that go beyond the inquisitive space so that was another very easy almost like we didn't even have to explain that to one another mm -hmm. there was that um, right away kinship um there was i i definitely arrived into the collaboration with a little bit more of um nervousness in regards to having being off the tails of being in many collaborations and understanding the intensity and intimacy the vulnerability all of the um uh the step, the time that it takes to really get to know somebody. And we were jumping in way, way deeper in the pool than I was used to. Um, yeah. And I think that apprehension was another reason that I said yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, because my tendency in general as an artist and then was just to be like, I really wanna know what I'm doing. I need to know how, I feel so um, wild inside. I'm sure a lot of people do. We all like 
this idea of how we present or how we compose and present is something I naturally am very, very aware of. So mm -hmm. um, a good thing and a bad thing. So, you know, I wanted to really be aware of, of the container and the way that we were presenting and she was kind of stripping that away from me. So I thought that was a good thing to be challenged, to be out of my comfort zone. So we started the process with um, a conversation of interest, like what are you, where are you at? What are you mm -hmm. interested in? Which is the way I like to start all my collaborations. And then there was some feeling out for me, what does it look like to meet? Um, what does it look like to meet body and sound? And, and what is that exchange? And, and how are we gonna build this up? And I think we started off really like organically and then had to kind of go on a, a little bit of an exhilarated path because we didn't have, it wasn't the situation to do, to start at that point. <laughs> so we, we started off really slow and then we kind of went into a much more individual but instinctual uh, responsive collaboration, which basically looked like talking about ideas and then each of us going and trying to respond to that idea within the medium that we were being responsible for. In my case, I was responsible for uh, creating the video that we would present that would be, give the voice, um, gives a visual to the voices and the bodies of, of the makers of the, of the sound. That's a very abstract way of saying I made the video. <laughs> <laughs> and and Christina has been, you know, just I'll let Christina speak for herself, but um, she's somebody that I'm, I'm very pleased to have in my uh, collective, my artistic collective, um, and has been always a, a really um, exciting person to collaborate in regards to, I have this idea, what do you think? How do we work with it? I don't know how to do this. You know, how do I do this? How do we do this? How do, how do we actually create the idea visually? I love that so much of, um, I mean, I love that how you came together really happened through this Three Jewels community too. I think that mm. that's, you know, such a, that's such a special story. And then from there you explored your individual interests and your and your mutual interests. Um, I know that the work explores the connection of sound and movement from sacred origins and with influences that come from Western classical music and psychedelic improvisation and Buddhism, Buddhism and mysticism. Um, Miriam, how did your relationship with engaging with these narratives begin? Well, I'm glad to say that I'm at a point creatively in my career where I no longer am, everything is kind of, I've said it, very sinew, everything's very in alignment. So uh, for me, the place where my connection to Buddhism and uh, the study of Buddhist philosophy with the active um, practice of meditation um, and teaching that, it it informs the way that my mind is practicing seeing. It's a it's a method of organized organization of what is the mind capable of? What is a relationship? What is automatic? What is not automatic? And and it creates to me like a system, like an operating system, that is the most optimal for creative creativity that's the way it functions for me is it, it it is this really beautiful relationship to an operating system that's how i see my buddhist practice and um study and so on does that does that answer that it it does yeah and, and marissa i'm curious where where you feel your relationship to these to these influences begins and how it was pulled into this piece yeah it's interesting. I feel, I think always when I'm, when you go back and describe something, it's always, it always comes after. It wasn't in this case for me, 
oh, let me draw from Western classical. Let me draw from mysticism. Let me draw from these things and see what I create. It was more the description going backwards of like, what, what, how was I working and what did I create? Um, and just knowing myself as a composer and musician, I know my lineages and um, what, what I've been working with since I was a young person. So it's just useful kind of to share that through copy with, with all of the, the audience. But the way that I, I would share in some ways what Miriam described, which is that for me, all these practices that I do are part of who I am and part of how I move through the world, part of how I see and perceive, part of how I hear. And I, I would offer just maybe one tangible specific thing, which is the work um, that I do throughout all these different practices of meditation and my the singing work that I do and that I teach has this element of inviting in the wholeness of the body, paying attention to the body, and using a process of, um, of attention, observation, like attention, uh, release and surrender into an experience, and then observation without judgment, trying to separate observation and judgment of that experience. So trying to just identify what I notice, what I see, and what I hear, and um, and that's what I'm doing constantly as a singer and as a musician is starting from my body, feeling how sounds move through my body, how I respond to external stimuli, including ideas, sounds, sensations, people, um, colors, and how that kind of channels through, moves through, and then comes out um and how i can continue to be a, a vessel to like deep be able to hold that all more deeply and more deeply and more deeply and so meditation practice helps me do that and singing practice is that experience for me and um so it's not it's not a separation it's just how i how i move through the world totally. uh, yeah yeah. And yeah, I wanted to just end Marissa and everybody listening, just to say one more aspect, because you reminded me something, um, is yes, it's an operating system in which I use, but I more and more have been consciously looking for how they translate in terms of like, if I'm teaching a class on classic Buddhism or logic, there's a language that's used that we define and then we play with that language to communicate ideas. If I'm working within a da um, music, um, improvised jazz community, we'll use a different language. Right. And I've been more and more very curious about the, the moment of translation between languages that are used to describe different um, mediums or I, um, uh, families of ideas and so like uh, looking at the connection between improvisation specifically or creative a certain genre that I come from and seeing how I can see similar principles that are applied within Buddhist philosophy within those music and dance worlds which I find just on a geeky level yeah. very exciting yeah. to find those like parallels. Yeah, that actually reminds me, Miriam, one thing that we did talk about quite consciously at the beginning, now that I'm remembering, that didn't come afterwards was, I have been very influenced by anthroposophy in my life. It's a, a system of thought. It's um, a kind of worldview, among other things, among Judaism and Buddhism. And one of the one of the specific systems of seeing and experiencing the world in anthroposophy in, involves identifying our bodies as more than just our physical bodies, but very specifically. So there's like the physical body, the etheric or energetic body, the astral body, which is the kind of the emotional body, and the eye, which is this like self-awareness. And those different layers, just having that vocabulary and studying that um, for many years in my life, was a useful tool for me in perceiving and going through the world 
to see more, to see in, when I look at a body or a physical something, to see it in layers. And I brought this up with Miriam early on. Now I'm remembering it turned out you knew about anthroposophy. You had gone to the... You, Miriam knew about it. It was, it was funny. So we also had that in common. But it's not... You know, it's not only in anthroposophy. There's in, in Buddhism too and in other mystical schools, there's different ways of seeing, different vocabularies of identifying different pieces and parts of us um, beyond just what, you know, very, very rudimentary science describes us in our common knowledge. So that was a way in which we talked back and forth about that. And even though we didn't specifically share that anthroposophical vocabulary, we understood the, the gesture behind it, like this kind of seeing layers. And we, that was actually very significant in how we approached the project, because that's a way that we both moved through the world and a place where we found resonance. And it was influential, I think kind of created a, a little bit of a foundation for us to communicate about how things travel through space and land from one from me to Miriam and Miriam to me and people in the ensemble even when we're not physically together. I'm so glad that you brought that up Marissa because it it actually it builds really well into my next question too which is just about I know so much of the the piece explores the the limits and edges of body and space and what that means and, and I love that you brought up this um, kind of notion or belief of, of layers of the body and, and what that can look like um, thinking about those influences and that and that framework Miriam and Christina, I'm I'm curious to hear from both of you. How did that how did that translate into the environment and the atmosphere that you create in the video itself? Uh, Miriam, I kind of I want to start with you, and then Christina, I'm curious where you where you fit into that creation process. Um, well, I this is the maybe it's the first not not the first time but what i did was i created a couple of pillars that i wanted to keep um as a way of of referring back to like a, a set of rules or a, a way of i guess like a way of having a discussion about this idea of where things meet how is something formed and so i decided to use color as a way or the lack of color as something that I would use throughout the film as a way to have a discussion about the emergence of form. So, you know, shades of something, the differentiation of those shades creates um, a separatism. Like this is not, no longer dark, it is light, therefore it is form and we can see it, acknowledge it. Um, which was uh, one, one way of doing that. That was one language that I spoke and shared with Christina was around color. And then the other language that I was using was the um, lang language of subject object in relationship to what are the contributing factors that allow us to see something to be like, how I guess ground and foreground the discussion of ground and foreground which you can goes into science and goes into philosophy for many years it's a discussion of who we are based on the environment so I think those two are not new themes but I was very articulate about keeping them in my in the forefront of my mind throughout the work and um and so the conversation that, you know, emerged was like, it can go into the conversation of like, how does the relationship to sound coming from the body and the body, like, when are they separate? How do you, you, uh, how do you articulate that they are coming from each other without separating them? You know, because as soon as you separate them, they look separate. Therefore, they have their own, um, yeah, they're no longer located together. So there was a tension there of, of how to maintain a cohesion and a relationship to body and sound, 
between body and form and because there's a tension there you know that happens like to acknowledge something therefore automatically separates it from the other thing mm -hmm. so we wanted to both acknowledge but not separate so that was really fun and and challenging and and left me with a lot of um, really great fodder to continue work for the rest of my life it feels like <laughs> yeah. so that that's my I don't know I'm curious with Christina yeah I mean I probably would just I mean I agree but I would probably just expand on the idea that it felt very a gradual and slow sort of movement of of like sort of solidifying form where even just like um referencing the first part as dark matter and thinking of it as um, this sort of expansive space, but then um, moving into the next part where the bodies become this sort of container of, of a visual space and of the, um, and we're introducing color again. I think that, um, it just felt like this sort of gradual transition into what it means to both be vast and then contain and then to meet. Yeah, it wasn't an easy, I mean, I would say no. to Christina, it was not an easy thing. And the choice to not, first of all, there's a definite clarity. I'd love to say to the audience, if it's not totally obvious, that we were not interested in presenting constellation core in the sense of like you would in a classical uh, stage performance realm, mm -hmm. that it was really about what is the essence? Like, can we utilize how the core, the practice that they have in sound making and see where my practice in movement and image making, where they meet and can we have that share? more in process than the aesthetic outcome, mm -hmm. which was such a really, I mean, I'm sure Marissa will pontificate on that, like a basis for how she works with the core. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there is a lot of abstraction in the way that the sound was presented. And it was a slow, slow pulling out of forms until the end. Um, because, you know, you graduate, it's one day, but you go to school for like so many days before you graduate. And it's the, all those so many days that form who we are and not that one moment where we're no longer in that school and free or whatever, you know, like paying homage to the process is something that sometimes results in a very different visual than one would expect. Mm -hmm. And I like to play in that space. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It really shows too in the, in the work. And I mean, I know I witnessed a lot of that just shepherding this project through with you all. And, and from our earliest conversations, it felt like an exploration of forms and distance too, in some ways. Like, what does it mean to explore these forms um, without being always in the physical presence of each other to create something and to collaborate? Marissa, I, I want to hear more about what the composition and recording process for this was like because I know that for uh, for a group like Constellation Course so much of your work has been in live performance and involves improvisation and creating the music for this during a pandemic meant a lot of things were very different. I remember you telling me that this piece is, is in many ways about exploring breath mm -hmm. and then my first thought was like how, how are we going to do that with a full choir right now? Um, thinking about it logistically, but I'm also really curious how some of those parameters inform the artistic process and um, whether it was in the recording or Hanan, you also, you're the sound designer on the piece. So I'm, I'm also very curious to hear from you after Marissa, where you came in with bringing all of these different recordings together since you had to go about the whole process very differently. Yeah. I mean, the process was the process was um, very different. Absolutely, I I spent two weeks in which I wrote the bulk, like composed the bulk of the material, part one and part three. Again, like the beginning and the first part and the end part. 
actually just, you know, was here in my space, kind of in my art, in an art and artistic retreat, trying to deepen my own practice, connect with a lot of what Miriam and I had talked about and create something that was going to be something I could give to the ensemble, ask them to learn and record. And that isn't, as you said, that's not always the way we work. A lot of times we are improvising our pieces in the moment, but we do also do composed pieces. That is a part of a part of what we do. And in those cases, what we're able to bring to them is kind of like um, an ability to, I think, an ability to bring moments more alive in the moment, to kind of use our bodied improvisational practice and our relationships with each other to be able to really tune in first to where each other are at and to actually what music is being sung in the moment. And, um, and then even in subtle, subtle ways, like shift how we're performing the piece based on what we're hearing and how we're being together. So um, one way that I like to describe this element of our practice often is that I am interested in what is behind the notation, notational concept of forte, for example, where something is you know, written in a score grow, growing in volume. And that on some, on some deep level, I would rather that in the end, the result would be actually day, like day crescendoing, like getting to um, like, I didn't say before, crescendoing to forte, like day crescendoing to, a, to something quiet with the, with the people singing, like having that gesture alive, even if the end result is opposite of what is written or asked for, I would rather that than um, creating a crescendo into a forte just because it's written there. So we're trying to understand as an ensemble together, like what does the actual present moment that we're in call for? Like, does it always have to be crescendo into forte? Or is there something else that the composer might be going for that is usually, um, is usually expressed by that kind of, that kind of moment? but could also be expressed differently. So that's something that we work with a lot, even when we're working with composed pieces. But the, in this case, it was entirely different because we had to record one by one in the studio. So we couldn't feed off of each other very much. We could a little bit. And that was at first, it was sad. Um, there was something I really longed for about particularly, as you said, the breathing and the space of no sound into sound that I wanted us to share. I wanted that feeling of feeling like the energy between us is thick and we're like feeling each other, waiting for each other, moving together. I had to get used to that. That didn't happen. And then on the other side of that, it was amazing being in the recording studio. There's also something you can't get live, like we could turn up the, the breath sounds very, very practically. So you can actually hear them vibrate more. And we could play with these tiny, tiny, tiny little sounds that are like somewhere in between silence and sound in a way that we still would in a live performance, but it would, it would come across so differently. So you get to hear that now. And the only way that it was somewhat similar in the process was that because I've worked with each person in the ensemble so much, you know, and for so many years, and we know each other well, I would be able to say as the composer of the piece, here is like, here's the main gesture going through these, these two pages. Yes, I want you to sing it as written, but also play around, play around, stay true to the gesture, but play a little bit. And so that happened in some moments and, and that was satisfying. Um, so uh, yeah, Hanan, I'm curious how, how it felt for you, you know, as ensemble member and recording and then doing this. Yeah, I remember we did try to sing it all, all through together when we were outside in an open space. And I remember like 
when you sing, when you're a group of, I don't know, 10, 12 people singing together, you feel the energy. And I saw that Marisa was a little disappointed for a second. It's like, oh, I wish we could like, uh, how do we make this energy like be in a recording? Because it is like you get something from a recording, but you give something and you lose a lot of the, the energy thing. So it was a lot of work of figuring out how you can bring the same energy and the same intentions and philosophy of a body as a voice, as a, as a body that works in a space um, while our space was um, a studio. So I, f I feel like it was very good for me being also a part of a core member and knowing the singing process and knowing how the approach to singing to apply it, to find ways to apply it on, on the sound. And uh, we had to find some tricks to make the, to make it not sound like people recorded in a dry room. We had to find like ways to make, to, to bring out, to record different spaces, to put the sound in, diff in we made even a trick of, I don't know if I should tell this yeah, yeah, secret. Yeah, tell, tell <laughs> but, secret. Yeah, but, um, but uh, on, in the first part, Marisa has like a, um, a beautiful reverb in, in uh, one of uh, in her studio, so we played that we played the recording in the studio and recorded the sound that coming from the walls in order to like feel the the natural reverb, not to use uh, an electronic one, to use really the the sound of the room. So we had to do a lot of different tricks and try to record um, different sounds from different places, so it would really give it this or organic feel and um, and and live up to to the experience of singing together or being in a space with a choir and another thing that we had to work with is also uh, looking looking at the video and understanding how how you feel that the sound is also organic to the video because the video also works in different spaces some of them are look a little bit like referencing our like imaginary spaces and how how does the voice the sound and the space can work together and feel like and in one one organism that is working together it was this was the challenge but it was also something that is very exciting to to try and figure out and see how how it connects yeah i just want to add and i feel you know so grateful to hanan it's such a gift to have inside of the ensemble people who are just doing so many different things and able to interact we're able to interact and bring different elements of our practices to each other and really a dream to have the kind of sound designer mixer be a member of the ensemble so that we already have that second secondhand language um and i just wanted to add that and oh and so i felt really safe um knowing hanan was doing this i felt really safe to play you know and that was great we recorded some sounds of sand um use that it kind of sounds like waves we recorded some of the mylar that Miriam and Christina were using, put that in there. And then almost finished with the whole mix, I came here to upstate where I now live and was sitting on outdoors and the other night, and it was like the most miraculous bird sounds that I had heard. And Hanan had pulled before like a kind of, I don't know where actually where you got it, but a different kind of bird track that was laid through the final part of the piece. But I was just sitting there hearing these birds and it was just like, wow, there's something so alive. And, and this space is so magical. And this space is where I wrote the piece. Like this is what I was interacting with and communing with while I was making the music. So recorded that on my iPhone and sent it to Hanan. And now that those bird sounds are, are in the piece. You can hear them mostly at the end. But that was also a special moment because it it felt so real. It felt so connected, you know, to the space that that I am in, both physically and therefore also emotionally and internally. So it felt really special to include that. I love the way that you were able to include some of these um, environmental sounds that wouldn't necessarily be part of the soundscape in a live performance, but you found a way to, like as you said, you were communing with them, and you found a way to bring them into the atmosphere of of this project 
I can't wait to see where the project continues to evolve and grow, um, you know, beyond Pioneer Works and Sawdust, or if there's ever a place for it at both of the venues that were really involved in the development of the piece. Um, and of course, CBA as well. Um, I want to yeah, thank be amazing. each of you. It would be totally amazing. Hopefully soon enough, we'll have live performance again. Well, um, I, yeah, I just want to quickly thank National Sawdust and Pioneer Works for creating this space for us. It was just truly remarkable and miraculous to have this opportunity to create work right now. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's for us too. It's, it's, so special to get to mm. find ways of making work at this time and thinking about how we can expand the form in different ways because we have a digital stage because we're working with um, artists like you both who come from live performance but also are curious to explore this digital landscape mm -hmm. so it's been more than a joy to work with all of you on this and thank you so much for your hard work on this piece it really shows and mm -hmm. i'm so thrilled that it's going to live on our on our website um, so thank you for being a part of the Digital Discovery Festival this season and special thanks to Pioneer Works for contributing to the development of this piece. Marissa Michelson and Miriam Parker are 2021 Toolman Fellows, a National Sawdust Partnership with the Center for Ballet and the Arts at NYU, dedicated to fostering interdisciplinary networks with composers and choreographers made possible by the Virginia B. Toolman Foundation. And this live stream is also made possible through the generosity of the Alphadine Foundation and with the public funds provided by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and in partnership with the New York City Council. So thank you to all of these organizations and producing partners and thank you so much to every single one of you. Congratulations.